NACDL is the Association of the Nation's Criminal Defense Bar. This afternoon, we have Laura Neerreiter and Steve Drizzen from Chicago. Um, Steve, both are probably familiar to many of you. Both have been involved with the Center for Wrongful Convictions. Steve is now the Assistant Dean of Northwestern's uh, School of Law Blum Clinic, a clinical professor of law, and also the, was, the former legal was the legal director of the clinic's renowned Center for Wrongful Convictions. Um, Steve has been involved for many, many years in the study of interrogations and false confessions. And Laura is an assistant clinical professor at Northwestern School of Law as well, um, and co-director of the Center of Wrongful Convictions of Youth at Northwestern. In connection with her work there, she's represented several defendants in high-profile cases that many of you have probably studied, um, including West Memphis Three and the Dixmore Five. Dixmore Five. It's a, it's a real pleasure and honor to be here you, with you today. Um, as Lindsay said, Laura and I hail from Chicago, the false confession capital of the world. <laughs> and we're here today because at the Center on Wrongful Convictions, we've had some great success in litigating false confession cases. Um, we've won cases in state court, in federal court, in clemency cases. We've won cases where there have been multiple false confessions in the same case. We've won cases with DNA, and we've won cases without DNA. And what we thought we would do today is sort of take you through how we analyze our cases from soup to nuts. Um, that's a lot to squeeze in into three hours, but we will try to do it. And the format for today's presentation is not going to track perfectly what's on your evaluation sheets. Those subject matters will be discussed. They may not be discussed necessarily in that order. Um, because I came down with a uh, bout of laryngitis last night. We've retrofitted this presentation to include a few more videos um, and a little bit less me. So when I think about why we've been successful, part of it has to do with our intake and screening process. Um, and we're going to talk about that today. Part of it has to do with our ability to create a compelling and coherent narrative of innocence. And part of it is because we've had more opportunities to litigate this because we are from Chicago, the false confession capital of the world. Um, approximately 20% of all DNA exonerations involve false confessions. And in Chicago, when you look at our, all of the exonerations that have come out of that city, more than 40% have involved false confessions. So we have a lot of practice. And I just want to say that there's no one recipe for success in these cases. And working on false confession cases, we've had our share of failures. And anybody who works in this field has to recognize that um, skill plays a big part, but luck plays an incredibly big part in success. But what I hope is, is at the end of today, you'll take away two or three or maybe more lessons from how we think about these cases and apply them in your own cases. So let's start with a little bit about false confessions. Um, there are hundreds of proven interrogation-induced false confessions. The number of the DNA exonerations involving false confessions is now at 60. 
but there are many, many more that don't involve DNA. And there are a number of very important data places, data sets that everybody who does this work should look to. Um, there's, of course, the Innocence Project database. There's the National Registry of Exonerations. And there are a number of articles that have been written by Richard Leo, Richard Offshe, and myself that have tallied together the numbers of false confessions around the country. When we look at these cases, as I said before, about 20% or so are involve false confessions. But if you look at the DNA exonerations and you look at the homicide cases, what you find is that, that mistaken eyewitness identification is not the leading cause of wrongful convictions in homicide cases. It's false confessions by a factor of about two to one. And when you look at these confessions, what you find is that many of them are highly detailed. These are not simple, I did it admissions, or I was a witness, or I was at the crime scene. They contain exactly the kind of detail that you would think a true confessor would provide. Unbelievable amounts of detail. What people were cooking when they were murdered, what they were wearing, what they um, said. Um, it is a complete coherent and compelling narrative, and that's why these folks have been convicted. And all of those facts, in all of these cases, did not come from the suspect. So when we look at these cases, we look for sources of contamination to explain why these confessions appear to be plausible. Many, many cases involve multiple false confessions in the same case. When I started at the Center on Wrongful Convictions, we had rejected two such cases in the past um, because there were four or five young people who had confessed to a murder. Their confessions were somewhat interlocking, although there were differences. Um, some of the defendants had even pled guilty to the crime. So it made some sense to not take that case as seriously. But we've learned that you've got to dig deeper in these cases. And we did dig deeper. And as a result of digging deeper and some DNA evidence, there are nine young men in Chicago who are free today. And then that, this change in the way we think about cases has occurred largely in the last 10 years or so. Some people do not want to deal with false confession cases that involve murders of loved ones. Um, when you go to trial in a case like that, you have to convince a jury not only that the confession, that false confessions exist, not only that false confessions occur most frequently in homicide cases, you also have to convince them that someone would confess to the unimaginable the killing of a child or a loved one. But it happens, and it happens with some frequency. And one of the cases that it happened with is this case of Marty Tancliffe, who's pictured on the side of this slide. Marty was convicted of murdering both of his parents uh, based upon a dubious confession that he gave to law enforcement authorities. And when he described what it was like to be interrogated, when he described what it was like to be grilled in the hours after experiencing the most grief anyone can imagine because he loved his parents, he said, it's like having an 18-wheeler driving on your chest and you believe that the only way to get that weight off is to tell the police whatever it is that they want to hear, even if it means admitting to a murder. There are a lot of myths about false confessions that we all have to deal with, both as post-conviction lawyers and as trial lawyers. And it, they boil down to trying to persuade a, the jury of several counterintuitive notions. I would never confess to a crime I didn't commit. That's what jurors think. And your goal as attorneys is going to have to be to persuade them 
otherwise. Only juveniles or many of the retarded persons falsely confess. It's not true. If you look at all of the studies, yes, they are overrepresented, but no, there are plenty of people of normal or even high intelligence that when pressured by police will falsely confess. Everybody has a breaking point. Sometimes it may take longer to get there than others, but anybody in this room could be made to falsely confess under the right set of circumstances. Jurors often think that people will only falsely confess if someone beat them or tortured them. That's the great myth of psychological interrogation, a myth that Reed and Associates has been talking about for years, that today's psychological interrogation tactics are not apt to produce a false confession. Well, perhaps the most powerful lesson of the last 10 or 20 years is that they can and that they do, and they do with some frequency. It's obvious when a confession is false. This is a myth that hurts clients and it hurts law enforcement officers. It's not always easy to distinguish between a true and a false confession, largely because of the phenomenon of police contamination. And many clients will confess after hours in the interrogation room because they think that their innocence will protect them, that when this case is, shine, is shown a light on, that everybody will just recognize it was a big mistake, that the truth will come out. But it doesn't. The confession becomes the truth. What happens when people falsely confess? Confession evidence is so powerful that the United States Supreme Court, um, citing an evidence treatise back in 1986, said the triers of fact accord confessions such heavy weight that the introduction of a confession makes the other aspects of a trial in court superfluous. Essentially, the trial occurs in the interrogation room where there is no counsel to represent you and where the police have almost free reign to question you. Confession evidence is so powerful that we know it corrupts other evidence. There are studies that show that if a fingerprint examiner or a polygraph examiner or a medical examiner, you'll hear about one, one of our exonerations where that occurred. If they learn at any point in the process before their final reports that the person they are examining has confessed, it's going to skew their findings. I don't know the answer to that question, um, whether this is in the materials, but we, we will make it available to you. Um, when people confess, police officers usually and often stop investigating at that point in time. They have their confession. There's no reason to continue investing resources in the case. Um, and it's very difficult to get them to reopen confessions. Um, and in the study that Richard Leo and I did, 81% of those defendants who chose to take their cases to trial and to claim that their confessions were false were wrongfully convicted. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, because of Steve's laryngitis, we're going to be trading off a little bit, so I hope you'll forgive the jack-in-the-box effect as we kind of go through this presentation. Um, well, the title of this presentation is Unsmelling the Skunk, and that's when I was kind of trolling around looking for a good title. You know, I thought there's so much evidence and there's so much understanding of the power of a confession, you know, and, and, and there's such a great understanding of the difficulty in undoing a case when somebody has confessed. And I thought unringing the bell, okay, that's like the normal metaphor that we would all, all read about. But then I came across, across this and I thought it was too good not to use. If you throw a skunk into the jury box, you can't instruct the jury not to smell it. That's from a Supreme Court case from 19, or a Fifth Circuit case from uh, 
1962. But uh, I thought that was great. Once somebody has confessed, even if that confes confession stinks to high heaven, how do you persuade somebody not to give that confession credence? And in our cases, right, because the subject matter of this, uh, of this presentation is post-conviction false confession work and post-conviction false confession work where there is no DNA evidence available for testing, that makes that skunk all the more smelly. So that's uh, going to be the subject matter of what we're talking about today. How do you unsmell that skunk? So as Steve said, Chicago has been dubbed the false confession capital. And um, while we're talking about the power of false confession evidence, again, DNA standard is DNA evidence is the gold standard in these cases, and it's what often many of us have been used to using. And I'd like to play for you now a clip. Uh, this is our longest clip. It's, it's about 10 minutes long from a 60 Minutes program um, that dealt with these false confession cases out of Chicago that shows the difficulty of litigating these cases even in the best possible world when you do have highly probative DNA evidence. Highly probative DNA evidence that not only excludes the defendants, but that identifies the real perpetrator as somebody with no connection to them. Um, so it, it, it'll show, um, I think, the difficulty of litigating the case, these cases even in the best circumstances. And, and just to uh, tell you a little bit more about these two cases, um, they're the cases of the Dixmoor Five and the Englewood Four, which are two cases out of Chicago that our office participated in along with the Exoneration Project and the Innocence Project, as well as other partners. Um, and uh, I think I'll let the case speak for itself through this clip. And that, this is at the moment at which I'm also gonna have to ask patience from you in terms of technology. Um, I'm going to have to click out of this, so forgive me, folks. There we go. Why would anyone confess to a crime they did not commit? It happens so often in Chicago. Defense attorneys call the city the false confession capital of the United States. Chicago has twice as many documented false confession cases as any city in the country. One reason may be the way police go about questioning suspects. And 60 Minutes has learned the Chicago Police Department is now the subject of a Justice Department investigation into its interrogation practices. Two cases we examined involved several teenage boys who were arrested and they say forced or tricked into confessing to violent crimes they never committed. Each spent nearly half their lives in prison. They're free now and told us their story together for the first time. The story will continue in a moment. We all of us got one thing in common. We did an extensive amount of time in jail for something we didn't do. And that's the bottom line. They each were sentenced to terms that range from 15 years to life. Terrell Swift, Michael Saunders, Vincent Thames, and Harold Richardson were convicted in one rape and murder. James Harden, Robert Taylor, and Jonathan Barr in a different one. All were found guilty based solely on confessions. Jonathan, you went in as, as a 14-year-old boy. Yes, sir. What'd you come out as? Came out as a 34-year-old man. Yeah, we was young, little kids. I miss my mama, man. I miss my mama and daddy, man. I, I, I miss my mama. It seemed like some days I can't function. Did she die when you were in prison? Yeah. Their troubles began in 1991, when Chicago was in the midst of a violent crime wave more than 900 homicides in 12 months. Police were under enormous pressure to solve those crimes. Terrell Swift was 17, was still in high school, had never been in serious trouble. When another teenager from his neighborhood implicated him, Vincent, Michael, and Harold in the rape and murder of a 30-year-old prostitute named Nina Glover. Did anyone ask you, Terrell Swift, did you murder this woman? That was the first thing they said. Whoa. Raped and beat who? Nina, I don't, I don't know Nina Glover. Uh, can I get my mother in here so I can get a lawyer? And nothing. Terrell voluntarily turned himself in to police and was placed in an interrogation room surrounded by several detectives. The questioning, he said, lasted for over 12 hours. How close were they? Show me physically how close were they? Like right here, you're going to die in jail. You're never going home. Mm -hmm. Yelling at you. Yelling at me. 
Were you scared? Did you cry? Did you... Absolutely. I was crying, uh, but no one listened. Terrell wanted to go home and says police told him if he admitted to the rape and murder, he could leave. So he signed a 21-page confession which gave specific details to how he and his co-defendants committed the crime. Now, I got to tell you, the first time I read it, all 21 pages, I said, that man is guilty. Right. Everything that's in that confession uh, was fed to us, myself and my co-defendants, by the police. Did they force you to sign? No. So why'd you sign it? I thought I was going on. I mean, you, were, you were 17 years old, so you weren't a child. I guess I was still uh, a mama's boy. Come on now, you had to know if you admitted to raping and killing a woman, you weren't going home to mama. I had no understanding of that. None. Terrell Swift would later recant, but it was too late. At trial, a judge believed the confession and sentenced him to 30 years. That whole ordeal, it done something to every last one of us. And with me, it made me numb. In the other case, Robert Taylor, Jonathan Barr, and James Harton were arrested in high school for the rape and murder of their classmate, 14-year-old Katrisa Matthews. They were taken into custody after a fellow student gave their names to police as possible suspects. Robert was 15. He says he was taken into an interrogation room and forced to sign a confession. Man, you being cuffed up and beat on by the police, Man, them people can get you to do what they want you to do. What did they make you do? Made me sign it. Well, I mean, that, that murdered me. It killed me inside. His co-defendant, James Harden, says he was told by police if he signed the confession, he'd be released immediately. They had the statement already wrote up, and the man say, do you want to go home and sleep in your bed tonight? So I said, hell yeah. So that's how easy it is for a person to sign their life away. Just the thought just being taken away from your pants and say, okay, I want to go home and sleep in my bed tonight. Hell yeah, I'm finna sign that. But James never got home that night. He and the others were tried, convicted, and sentenced to life in prison. There's nothing worse as a prosecutor than playing a role in sending an innocent person or people to prison for many years. There's nothing worse. Bob Milan should know. As a young prosecutor, he worked this case and would eventually rise to second in command in the Cook County State's Attorney's Office. Now in private practice, he says publicly for the first time he should have examined the confessions more closely. I never believed anybody would confess to a horrible crime they didn't commit. I didn't believe it. I didn't believe people would confess to rape and murder of a woman, you know, just didn't believe it. But based on my experiences, uh, I found it, it did happen. These young men lost a lot of good lives. I was part of it. I, I didn't mean it. I never would have done that intentionally, but it doesn't make it any easier. Yeah. Haunts you still, it sounds like. Sure, always will. Why would a detective push for a false confession, do you think? What happens is it's tunnel vision, okay? They get locked in on this individual. So the anonymous phone call, the confidential informant, the well-meaning witness sends them in the wrong path. Chicago has a long history of false confessions. A Chicago police board found former Commander John Burge guilty of physically abusing suspects, from the use of electric shock to putting a gun to a suspect's head. So far, more than 85 convictions have been overturned in Illinois since 1989, many as a result of police misconduct. Quite simply, what Cooperstown is to baseball, Chicago is to false confessions. It is the Hall of Fame. Peter Neufeld was one of the defense attorneys representing these men. He's the co-founder of The Innocence Project, an organization that's helped exonerate 300 wrongfully convicted men nationwide with the use of DNA testing. There are more juvenile false confessions in Chicago than any place else in the United States. What's happening? It's not because the kids are different that makes them more vulnerable to confessing. It's because the way the police keep pounding and pounding and pounding away in those interrogation rooms, you get innocent kids to confess to crimes they didn't commit. Cook County State's Attorney Anita Alvarez disagrees. Responding to public pressure, she set up a new unit within her office to re-examine questionable prosecutions. But she defends the actions of the police in these two cases. We have not uncovered any evidence of any misconduct uh, by the police officers or the state's attorneys that would took the statements in these cases. Alvarez still believes the confession Terrell Swift gave in the Nita Glover case 
despite the fact there was no DNA evidence linking him or the others to the crime. Did you find any of the boys' DNA on the victim? No, we didn't. Did you find any of their DNA in the basement of the house? No. How do you explain that the boys would say they raped a woman and there not be any DNA evidence? Doesn't it strike you as odd? Well, we, I, we would love to have DNA on everything and every, and, and every piece of evidence that we have in every crime, but it doesn't necessarily uh, you know, occur. Last year, the Innocence Project retested the one DNA sample that was recovered inside the victim, Nina Glover. It was submitted to the National DNA Database, and a match was made to Johnny Douglas, a serial rapist and convicted killer who is now deceased. But the new discovery did not change Anita Alvarez's mind. You find out years later that, in fact, the DNA found inside the victim's body belonged to Johnny Douglas. And Johnny Douglas is a convicted serial rapist and murderer. That doesn't tell you that he most likely is the person who killed this woman? No, it doesn't. Is he a bad guy? Absolutely he is. Absolutely. Um, but can we prove, just by someone's bad background, that they committed this particular crime? It, it takes much more than that. For her to just say, DNA is not everything, well, what else do you have if DNA don't matter? This was a rape and a murder. How can you say DNA is nothing? Why would a confession trump DNA evidence? Because confessions are incredibly compelling. Nobody can understand how they would ever be goaded into confessing to something they didn't do. Saul Kasson is a psychology professor at John Jay College of Criminal Justice and has studied police interrogation practices and false confessions for 27 years. One would think DNA is supposed to solve our problems. It's supposed to identify the perpetrator and absolve the innocent. Here you have cases where they absolve the innocent, but we don't believe them because the innocent have confessed. And so the DNA doesn't matter anymore. In the case of Robert Taylor, Jonathan Barr, and James Harton, DNA found inside the 14-year-old victim, Catrice Matthews, was also retested. And a match was made to Willie Randolph, a 34-year-old convicted rapist with 39 arrests. Peter Neufeld says prosecutors rejected the DNA evidence and instead came up with an unusual theory to explain it all away. They suggest perhaps after the kids killed her, this man wandered by and committed an act of necrophilia. Necrophilia. A lot of our viewers won't know what that means. Having sex with a dead person. It's possible. We have seen cases like that. but Possible? It, it is, and you know, we've seen it in other cases. It's possible that this convicted rapist wandered past an open field and had sex with a 14-year-old girl who's dead. Well, there's all kinds of possibilities out there, and what I'm saying is that I don't know what happened. People don't like to admit they, they made a mistake, but we need to do that. I mean, our job as a prosecutor um, isn't to win. Our job is to get it right. Former prosecutor Bob Milan says prosecutors need to put the same sense of urgency into exonerations as they once did into prosecutions. When you have physical evidence, it doesn't lie. So when you have the DNA on a girl from some guy with a, with a history of uh, sexual attacks, um, that pretty much tells you where you're going. Not the people who gave the confessions? No. By now, 10 defense attorneys were focusing on the new DNA. Working with them was a third year Northwestern Law School student named Katie Marie Zuhari. She was assigned to re-examine the original confession and her research helped change the case. I think when you look at a confession on a piece of paper, a court-reported confession, a handwritten confession, it seems like all the pieces are in place. But what you don't see is the 17-year-old in the room by himself with the police officers. What you don't see is that confession next to the other confessions. So you're able to see that these things don't match up. Zuhari discovered the boys' confessions contain different accounts of the crimes from the chronology to their own nicknames. They get the framework right, but they don't get the details right. And if any two of them had gotten the details right, that would be one thing. But when you look at each of these confessions line by line in the way that we did, it's, it's pretty glaring that there's no cohesive story here. Last year, based on the new DNA evidence and Katie Marie's work, the courts vacated the convictions and granted all of them certificates of innocence which restore their full rights as U.S. citizens. As for Anita Alvarez, she's still not convinced Terrell Swift and his co-defendants are innocent. I don't know whether he committed the crime or not. There are still unanswered questions in both of these cases 
that I couldn't sit here t today and tell you that they're all guilty or they're all innocent. What would you say to her if you could? I was wrongfully incarcerated for 15 years, and you're still fighting my innocence. Not only mine, but the, my co-defendants. What else needs to be done? During our interview, Terrell's mother, who was in the room at the time, became emotional. I can hear you crying over there. Why are you still shedding tears? That was hard to actually have your child taken away from you. And he was innocent, and I knew this from the beginning. But what can I do? I'd be able to get my child, my baby, my firstborn. That was hard, and it still is. Yeah. He came through it, the grace of God. So, we're going to refer to this case somewhat throughout the rest of the presentation because many of the themes that we're going to talk about are, are very present in this case, um, in those two cases. And, and what we also want to impress upon you is that we evaluate a case the same way, whether it's a DNA case or a non-DNA case. When we take a case, we don't know whether there's going to be DNA or fingerprint testing or, or some forensic bullet. So we have to systematically deconstruct the confessions the same way, um, either way. Let's start with what is a false confession. What is a confession? A confession is really anything that the law enforcement officers think inculpates your client in a crime. That's the way they view confessions. But there are different levels, different kinds of statements that are used against our clients in these cases. There's an inculpatory statement. This is just a statement saying that you were present when the crime occurred, even if you didn't play a significant role. You've put yourself in the crime scene, and that can be enough to get you charged um, with a crime. There's an admission, a simple I did it statement. Sometimes, but very rarely, a suspect is so broken down, he, he says, I did it. But he can't come up with the details of the crime, or he's wildly wrong in those details. And police officers don't feed those details to him. So all they have is an admission. And then there's a full confession with a post-confession narrative. This is the gold standard of confession evidence. This is a confession that is chock full of the details that only a true perpetrator would know. And that's what we're seeing in most of the proven false confessions in the DNA cases. They are not mere admissions. They are not mere inculpatory statements. They are compelling narratives that make you think that the person who signed his name at the bottom of that statement must have committed the crime. How do we prove a confession is false? Well, when we look at false confessions as researchers, Richard Leo and I have a very conservative standard before we call something a proven false confession. There are many, many more cases that don't meet this standard where the confessions are unreliable. But a proven false confession can be proven false in four ways. It's physically impossible for the defendant to have committed the crime. Our most recent confession exoneration involves a man named Daniel Taylor. And Daniel Taylor confessed to participating in a double murder in Chicago in the 1990s. The problem was is that Daniel Taylor was locked up on a disorderly conduct charge several miles away in a police lockup at the very time that the crime had occurred. Um, he can't be in two places at once. It's physically impossible for him to have committed the crime. The police knew about that early in their investigation, yet they were able to persuade a jury that the record keeping by the police at the lockup was not very good. And so he was convicted and spent 20 years in prison. And the only way we were able to exonerate him was because of some Brady material that we discovered that showed that 
prosecutors had interviewed the lockup keeper and several other um, people associated with the um, lockup and knew that they were all saying that our Daniel Taylor was locked up at the time of the crime. Um, forensic evidence proves the confession false. Doesn't have to be DNA evidence. It can be fingerprint evidence. Regardless of the potential unreliability of fingerprint evidence, you should still do fingerprint testing because um, if someone else's fingerprints are at that crime scene and that person has no connection to you, um, to your client, then that is very powerful inculpatory evidence. We have a case right now in Chicago, another multiple false confession case from Chicago police where a man's fingerprint was on the back of a pricing sticker on a stolen car from a used car lot. There's only two people whose fingerprints could have been on that lot, on that sticker. The person who put it on, the owners, and the person who took it off and drove away in it after he shot and killed the two used car dealers. The person whose fingerprints is a criminal, has a criminal record and doesn't have any connection to our clients. It's powerful evidence that his confession is false, especially when his name is not mentioned in any of the confessions of any of the defendants. No crime ever occurred. This actually happens. It's the rarest of all false confessions. Um, there are a number of cases where women confess to giving birth to children um, uh, who died, and it turns out these women had their tubes tied so they couldn't get pregnant in the first place. Um, and these are often cases where no body for the baby is found also, so the police are only surmising that there was a death. And the true perpetrator is reliably identified. The biggest bunch of these cases obviously is in forensic cases, but there are also cases, and if you look at your police reports, there's usually somebody else in there who was a good, solid first suspect in a case that for whatever reason was rejected, sometimes because they may have been passed a polygraph test. But the true perper perpetrator is reliably identified. Sometimes what happens is these people undergo a religious conversion in prison or have a crisis of conscience and they come forward and they say that they were the one who committed the crime that your client was convicted of. Sometimes they're locked up for the rest of their life in prison anyway. So at that point, they don't have anything to lose. So you should go back and you should interview them because they may be more willing to come forward with the truth if it's not going to make a difference. Most of the confessions we see, we cannot prove to be false. But we know that they are unreliable. And that's what we're going to talk about, how we try to establish the unreliability. This is a useful tool that we use when we talk about the kinds of false confessions. We don't really care about voluntary false confessions. These are not police-induced or interrogation-induced confessions. These are when people like John Mark Carr come forward because he wants a plane ride out of Thailand to come back to the United States for a sex change operation and says, I killed John Benet Ramsey. Um, he didn't kill John Benet Ramsey, but he confessed to it. It's a voluntary false confession. Most false confessions are either coerced, coerced compliant or coerced internalized. And coerced compliant or stress compliant is another name for this, is the most common. These are when the pressures of the police interrogation um, bring a suspect to a place of such hopelessness that he confesses to a crime he didn't commit, usually after the police offer him inducements or benefits that make it rational to do so. This is the psychological interrogation tactic-induced false confession, and it's most of the bread and butter of the work we do. Coerced internalized false confessions are fascinating, and um, there are a growing number of these, especially in very long interrogations, where the suspect has some kind of a 
a disability, whether it's alcohol related or drug related, um, that causes them to doubt their own memory. And police officers often suggest that they might have committed the crime in a blackout and ask them to provide a hypothetical statement of how that might have occurred. Well, once they give that statement, the might of from the police officer's position becomes a certainty. And some of these suspects for a short period of time, after they're told over and over again that their confession matches the evidence, actually believe that more likely than not, they committed the crime. It's usually fleeting. It usually only lasts until the interrogator leaves and the fog of the interrogation clears. But the power of these tactics is such that can actually cause a belief change in subjects. So what we're going to talk about now are, are three cases that we've worked on in the last few years that show you the different ways these confessions come to us, why we decided to take these cases through the intake process, and also talk about the results of these cases. This is my client, Nicole Harris. She was one of the first letters I opened up when I came to the Center on Wrongful Convictions. In May of 2005, she went to go do some laundry across the street, um, and she left her two children home alone for a very brief period of time. And she told them, because she needed her boyfriend to help her carry the laundry, whatever you do, don't leave this apartment. She did the laundry, um, put it in, and she came back with her boyfriend, and the kids were outside. And so she disciplined them. Um, she didn't hurt them. She spanked them and sent them to her room. Her boyfriend, who had been up all night, went to sleep. And she went back to, to collect the laundry. And as she was coming back from the laundromat, she saw her boyfriend running down the stairs with her son in her arms, and he was blue and not breathing. They got into a car. They were new to the neighborhood. They drove around for a while. They couldn't find the hospital. They flagged down somebody who had a cell phone, a complete stranger, and they called the ambulance. The ambulance came um, after my client was coaching her boyfriend how to conduct CPR. What had happened was, is the boyfriend woke up and he went in to check on his two children, two young boys, and one of them had a string from a, an elastic bed sheet wrapped around his neck. And he had strangled himself. Um, but the boyfriend took the sheet off, threw it away, tampered with the crime scene evidence in a fit of anger, and when the interrogators um, came to the hospital and spoke with Nicole after the child had been declared dead, they thought that either she or her boyfriend must have strangled the child. 27 hours later, she produced a court-reported statement in which she admitted to strangling her child. And this is the most damning part of it. And after you wrap the string around, the elastic around his neck four times, what did he do? Nothing. Was he, was he crying anymore? No. Was he moving anymore? Not that I remember. When we saw this video, it's a 17-minute video. She is calm. She is scared. She is cold. She is clearly um, weak from all the interrogation, but it was compelling. And we knew that the jury, you know, we, we immediately understood why the jury had convicted her. And we'll talk a little bit more about why we took that case when, after Laura talks about the next case. So as Steve said, uh, in Nicole's case, there was a recording, but it was just of the final confession, just those final 17 minutes that follow the 27 unrecorded hours. So 
that's one, one form of confession that we get, right? Just the recorded confession, just the recorded statements itself at the tail end. Well, there's another better kind of case that comes our way, and that's one in which the entire interrogation was recorded. And that's what happened in the case of Robert Davis, which is a case out of Virginia. Uh, it happened in 2003 in a small town in Western Virginia called Crozet. A house burned down in the middle of the night and the firefighters were called. It was on a quiet residential street, a small house. Um, and the firefighters came to the house and they went upstairs and the house was badly damaged. But they, they subdued the fire and they went upstairs and they found in a, in a bedroom upstairs, the woman who lived in the house uh, was dead in her bed, but not dead from smoke inhalation. She'd been stabbed and the knife was still in her back. And it appeared that her throat had been cut as well, although her body at this point had been so badly charred, it was hard to tell. And in the other room, they found the body of her two-year-old son, who had died of smoke inhalation, in the fire that now evidently had been set to cover up the stabbing of the, of the mother. So this is a horrible crime out of Western Virginia, and Robert Davis was a neighbor. Uh, he was 18 years old. He lived with his mother on the same street as the house that was burned down. And Robert was picked up and interrogated, and I will tell you more later about the circumstances of this interrogation as well, but over the course of about a five or six hour interrogation uh, overnight, um, he produced a lengthy detailed statement. It's just as detailed as Nicole's. I don't know if you saw that little snippet we pulled out of Nicole's, but it had detail about how she had supposedly killed her child, and, and Robert Davis gives similar detailed information in this confession. You know, I held her down while they tied her up, then I hit her, he's, he's confessing to doing this with other kids. And then I hit her two times, you know, I stabbed her. He's, one or two times I stabbed her. He's giving details. And this is accurate, she was stabbed one or two times. And so this is another type of confession that comes across our plate, right? A confession in which the interrogation is recorded, but just like Nicole, it's a detailed, credible seeming statement, right? What do you do with these cases when they come to your office, when the confession sounds like it might be credible? Before I answer that question, let me tell you about a third type of confession that comes across our plates. This is, right, the worst kind from a litigation perspective. This is one without any recording whatsoever, and it's unfortunately common. This is the case of a young man named Daniel Villegas, another uh, case that was sent our way. Um, this is a case from El Paso, Texas, from 1993. And the confession here is just typed out, as you can see. There's no recording, no nothing, no memorialization whatsoever of what happened in the interrogation room. It's a drive-by shooting case from 1993 in a Latino neighborhood of El Paso, Texas. Um, it's a simple case, really. Four teenage boys were walking home in the middle of the night from a party. A car drove by them once, slowly slowed down as it saw them, then kind of went, we think it went around the block, uh, reappeared moments later. Somebody stuck a gun out of the passenger side, fired shots. Two of the um, four boys on the sidewalk were killed and another was wounded. Daniel Villegas, who was 16 years old, was picked up for this crime. He was interrogated for hours. And eventually, as you can see, he signed a lengthy, detailed statement. Look at all the details in this. Doesn't it seem that it might have the ring of truth? We turned out, this is all accurate. We turned out, we, we then turned on a street off of Trans Mountain Street. We stopped the car. Mondo, one of the victims, then started to say, what's up, what's up? And then I wanted to scare them with a gun. I fired one time in the air, and then I leveled the gun at the four guys and began to fire. This is damning stuff, right? These details. They all started to run, and the guys started to yell that one was getting away. I saw Mondo running towards the house. We chased them in the car. We were trying to find them. Someone in the car yelled, he saw my face. Finish him off. They were talking about Mondo. Someone did finish him off. There were about five or six shots fired. That's accurate accurate detailed statements. What do you do with these kinds of cases when somebody is claiming these statements are false? Well, there's no magic answer. We can't tell you there's one thing in these non-DNA cases that you can do. But here's what we do. When, we, when we're confronted with statements like Daniel's, like Nicole's, like Robert's, recorded, unrecorded, partially recorded, there's kind of an initial screening checklist that we do in our office. First, and this is basic stuff, we gather the documents. We want to see the confession. You know, give me the, the court reported, typed, recorded, whatever you've got. I'd like to see it. The court file, very, very important, basic stuff. We get the trial transcripts, we read them. We do our homework about the basic facts of what this court case entails. But an important step for us in many of our cases is we reach out to the attorneys who represented these people at their trials 
it's amazing. So often we contact defense attorneys and we say, hey, do you remember that guy, Daniel Villegas? Or do you remember that woman, Nicole Harris? And the defense attorney will say, yes. I have, in my nightmares, for 10 years, I remember this case. This is the case that has stuck with me. It's amazing how often we hear that. And that's something that's very, very interesting to us when we do hear it. One of the, one of the things that we also do is we gather as much as we possibly can all of the newspaper coverage and media coverage about the case when the crime occurred. Um, many times our clients have not been interviewed until several news cycles have passed and police um, often leak details of these crimes to the general public when they talk about their crimes in the days after a crime occurs. And so we want to know what information was in the neighborhood, was in the public space, in the public domain. Because if it's out there and it ends up in our confession, that's another possible source of contamination. So we always do that. The big thing is, for us also, is um, how long has this person been claiming their innocence? Is this a new thing? Or have they been reaching out ever since the day they were locked up, reaching out to whoever they can get to answer a letter? You know, have they been repeatedly making these assertions, repeatedly, repeatedly trying to look for help? That's persuasive. It doesn't tell you, you know, it's not, it's not the end of the inquiry, but it's an important fact for us to know whether this assertion of innocence is new or if the person has stuck with this story the whole time. Um, one more exception here is that oftentimes people who have admitted their innocence all the way up through trial, at some point in time in mm -hmm. parole proceedings, will change their posture and claim that they were in fact guilty. Sometimes it's based on jailhouse lawyers who give them that advice. Sometimes it's just a practical response to a parole board member who says, as long as you continue to say you're innocent, you're never gonna get home. We do not hold that against clients when we evaluate their cases. We talk to them about it, um, but it's not a reason to reject a case. Also not a reason to reject a case, although an interesting fact is whether there were pleas in the case. Um, as you can see from the, the, the cases that were profiled in 60 Minutes, both of those cases involved some of the defendants pleading guilty. But they were clearly innocent, and in, in hindsight, their confessions, of course, are clearly false. So a plea is an interesting fact. Sometimes it's, it's a problem for the claim of innocence, but it need not be dispositive, and we're going to talk more about that later. We interview the client, of course, as I'm sure we all do, but we ask them questions like, would you be willing, if it ever becomes available, to submit to DNA testing in this case? Sometimes we even ask, although we don't put credibility in, in polygraphs, but sometimes we just ask the client, would you be willing to submit to a polygraph? If the answer is no, that might be a red flag. But if the answer is yes, I want to do the DNA testing, sure, I'll take a polygraph, I'll do whatever you want to try and convince you that I'm innocent. That's something that we consider important. Has the victim's family ever expressed doubts? I love those cases. They're few and far between, but they're fantastic ways uh, to get to cases. Alternative suspects, are they in the, in the court file, in the trial transcript? Was there a third party defense put on or, or attempted to be put on? And this is important. Can you identify a path forward for these folks? Or is, is relief just barred entirely by the law of, of your jurisdiction? Is this person helpable, basically? So again, there's no magic formula to any of this stuff. And certainly we've, we've been wrong uh, before when we take cases, but there's some things, you know, and it's different for every case and every one of us, but some things just have the ring of truth. This is one of our clients, an eloquent statement of innocence at his allocution. This is from his trial transcript. This, our client said, it's bothered me a great deal that the victim's family, which we've redacted, has lost a loved one. And the feelings that I have for them are very heartfelt. And so are my feelings for everyone else that has lost loved ones to violent crime. But I want them to hear from me, not the media or anybody else. I am not the one who took your son. I hope you believe what I'm saying because it's the honest to God truth. It's powerful when you read something like that. Also powerful on the right hand side, this is another one of our clients. He sent us photocopies and responses that he'd kept of letters that he had sent out over the years requesting help. An absolute stack, this is just some of them. A stack of letters that he sent out from prison, all, all of course handwritten to every organization in the country. He's writing the Department of Justice, he's writing everybody in the country he can think of with the word justice in their name, begging for help. 
it's, it's persuasive. And in these letters that they write, I want to talk to you a little bit about what is said. This letter on the right is, is from Nicole Harris. Uh, this was the woman that Steve discussed convict, who falsely confessed to killing her son. She's describing in her letter asking to take the case details that match what we know about the way police interrogations can happen and how they can go wrong in producing false confessions. She writes, the detectives constantly interrogated me. They pushed and shoved me. They threatened me. They told me I would never see my son again, her, son that, her second son that lived. They told me that they were going to be forced to turn the file over to the state and that they were going to slam me, et cetera. And they made promises that I would never be able to, that I would be able to go home. They also kept twisting my words and adding things to the story. A day and a half later, after there were no sleep, being taken to a polygraph center, being called a liar and a murderer, being told I was never going to see my son again, and that I was going to spend the rest of my life in jail if I didn't cooperate, I eventually gave in and gave a false statement. I thought that I would be able to go home or at least bond out. They had also told me that I wouldn't have a high bond because I didn't have a background. This is a detailed statement of her interrogation, a detailed, credible account that again matches what we generally know about the ways that police interrogations can become coercive. Other letters that we received, this bottom right hand one is, is powerful. This is from Daniel Villegas. Daniel Villegas writes, do you realize how discouraging it is to know you're innocent of a crime, yet have no one believe you because of a coerced confession? The very first thing that they say is, if you didn't do it, why did you confess to it? I would never confess, confess to nothing I didn't do. At which he writes, you're lost for words, because no matter how you try to explain it to them, they do not believe that the police would ever coerce you into a statement. These are powerful words from these, these defendants seeking help, which of course raises the question in our work, is there a bias? in favor of the literate when we accept these cases. There are many people out there, I, I, I firmly believe that many people out there who falsely confessed, who've been wrongfully convicted, or treated unjustly in various ways, who can't express because of educational deficiencies or whatever, who simply can't express themselves as, as incredibly well as these folks happen to in these letters. And so that's a, something that we grapple with all, all the time in our office. But one of the things that we do to counter that is obviously we interview the clients, and we spend a lot of time interviewing them and getting them to talk to us, even sometimes role playing as to what happened in that interrogation that caused them to confess to something they didn't commit. And if their stories are consistent with the stories in their letters, or if they can provide a credible account, that counts for a lot. In cases involving multiple defendants, we frequently interview all of the defendants. In the cases that we, you saw in the Englewood case, we were the first ones to go interview them, and we interviewed every one of the defendants. We did so because we wanted to see if their stories were consistent. We also wanted to see which case would be the better case for us to take. Some of them had procedural hurdles that would have made it more difficult. But when you get confirmation from other defendants that they experienced the same thing, um, that was another strong point in our deciding to take the case. Um, so literacy does help. I mean, the more powerful the letter, the more advocates there are in the field vouching for your innocence, it's a plus factor. But again, if they can't write clearly, it doesn't mean we're going to reject it. One thing, another thing I should say is, if, if they're just using words like, I was coerced, or I was framed, or there was a conspiracy by the police officers, um, that's generally a, a red flag um, that they're not able to really articulate what happened to them. And, and it's a reason that we go down and we grill them about it. All right, so I think it's five minutes till our first break, so I'm going to finish up with just a quick discussion of our intake, the rest of our intake procedures, and then we're going to move on to once we've decided uh, to take a case after the break, we'll talk about what we, what we do to work it up. So I just wanted to pass this on to you because I think it's, it's very interesting. This is Bob Milan, who was um, featured in that 60 Minutes video. He, was, he is the former second-in-command at the Cook County State's Attorney's Office. That's where Chicago is located. 
And as you saw in the video, he's come to believe, in fact, that false confessions do exist. They're not just unicorns that exist in the imagination of defense attorneys, they really happen. And he's written articles and he goes around doing training to law enforcement, whoever will have him, about these phenomena. And he's developed his own screening checklist that I thought was very uh, useful for us on the other side to take a look at. This is a prosecutor's point of view, uh, a believing prosecutor's point of view on false confessions. He says, an important thing to look at, is there a reliable nexus between the crime and arrest? What does that mean? Um, to him, this means if it's an anonymous tip that says go interrogate this guy, that's, you know, he doesn't view that as a reliable nexus. He wants something with a firm evidentiary basis, not just some confidential informant, anonymous tip, that sort of thing. Um, the question that nexus is something he would advise prosecutors to do. Do the co-defendants know each other? This happens a lot in multiple false confession cases. The striking thing you'll see is People are confessing to doing this, these crimes together, but they really don't know each other. The police have got it wrong from the beginning. These people wouldn't be cooperating in some crime. They, they simply just don't have a relationship. Sometimes they're even sort of antagonistic towards each other. We've seen this several times, and so has he. So he advises law enforcement to be wary when co-defendants don't know each other. Makes sense to me. Is the person confessing mentally challenged or juvenile? That's another thing on his checklist, something we'll talk about later, especially how youthfulness can impact uh, false confessions. Were charges pressed in spite of or without a full examination of physical evidence? Again, this seems basic, but it, this is something that requires training amongst law enforcement. It, was there a DNA exclusion before trial? Was there a fingerprint exclusion before trial? We've seen cases like that, uh, cases like those profiled in the 60 Minutes special in which charges were pressed and people went to trial despite the fact that forensic evidence excluded them before trial. It's a red flag. Does the defendant have an unbroken alibi? Well, that's a big one. Daniel Taylor, the case that Steve mentioned, the guy who was in jail at the time he supposedly was, con you know, was committing this, this murder according to his confession. Big problem. Again, something that he, he tells law enforcement. Finally, was this a one-hit wonder? Robert Davis case. Robert Davis is confessing to committing this, this, this stabbing and then the arson in Virginia He's got no record. This is a great guy. This is someone you could have lived next door to you, no problem. But all of a sudden he's confessing to this crazy crime, this horrible, horrible crime. This is, and, and Bob Milan's checklist is, look, if you see that kind of a situation, it just doesn't make intuitive sense. If it's a one-hit wonder, think twice. There's simply nothing more powerful than a law enforcement officer who has taken a false confession and who has seen the light. Um, and when Bob wrote that article, I got a copy of it, and I called the Chicago Tribune, and they did a, a puff piece on how Cook County prosecutors were training their own to prevent against false confessions. And there has not been a brief that I have filed since I got that article where I haven't attached that article. Um, so um, we've built a relationship with Bob Milan. He comes to our class. He lectures to our class. We have the same relationship with the Reed guys as well. Um, sometimes you find friends in unusual suspects, and when you do, you milk them for all they're worth. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so to apply these principles very quickly to the three cases we discussed, Nicole Harris, uh, Robert Davis, and then down at the bottom, Daniel Villegas, why did we accept Nicole Harris's case? Well, it was Steve who actually made the decision so we can speak to it more directly, but, but the real reason is there was a huge piece of evidence once, once Steve and his colleagues who took the case got into this record, there was a huge piece of evidence there. Remember, she had two sons who were in that bedroom. One of them was found with the elastic band wrapped around his, his neck, strangled. What about the other son? He was excluded from trial, not allowed to testify under competency grounds. He was young. He was a young child, but he saw his brother die, and he gave a statement to, get to that effect. He said, we were playing. I think they were playing Spider-Man. And uh, he, in the court, and he, had a cape, he was using the sheet as a cape and got tangled. He got the cord tangled around his neck, the little brother did. And that's how it was an accidental strangulation. And he was able to describe how he watched his brother fall asleep, as he said. Um, that's powerful stuff. That's why we took that case. Robert Davis in Virginia, that's a, a very different process for us. What, are, what we did there, when we got that confession transcript, and we're going to go through it with you guys later to show you what we mean. 
It's filled with threats of the death penalty, and, but most importantly, it's filled with contamination. This is a case where this guy who was interrogated for six hours broke on camera, and, but didn't know what to say until those officers told him. There are points on tape which will show you where he's actually begging them, please tell me how did I kill her? And it's powerful stuff when you read it. That's a powerful reason to take the case for us. And then the third one, Daniel Villegas, it's a different reason in that case. There, Daniel, this is the drive-by shooting down in El Paso, Texas, with the, with the typewritten, detailed statements. Well, you start looking into those details and you realize things like, well, the guy that Daniel Villegas said was in the passenger seat of the car, front passenger seat, was actually locked up in prison at the time. Couldn't possibly have taken part in this crime. Another uh, man that he said was in the car with him was on house arrest, electronic monitoring. There's absolutely no way he was in the car. There are major factual, factual inaccuracies with this confession, and that's the kind of thing where we said, okay, we'll take this case. A couple of quick things um, to touch on. Multiple defendant cases, we've talked about that as well. Multiple false confession cases. It's not uncommon to see multiple false confessions in the same case. There are lots of those cases that we'll talk about. And usually what happens in these cases, once police obtain the first statement, then they'll go and bring that to, this, to the other uh, co-defendants and use that statement to prompt the other co-defendants to at least say, yes, I was there, I was a witness, and once you place yourself there, it doesn't take much more pushing to turn that into an inculpatory statement. And last but not least, we mentioned this, what if somebody in the case pled guilty? How should that impact your intake and screening process? Well, it should make you look harder but it shouldn't be the end of the inquiry. False, conf false guilty pleas account for almost 10% of the exoneration cases that are in the National Registry of Exonerations database right now. And in some of those cases, the people who pled guilty, not only pled guilty, but they testified against their other co-defendants all the while, while everybody in the case, every, all the charged individuals were factually innocent. This happened in the Norfolk Four case, the case out of Virginia that a lot of us are familiar with, I know. Um, so in short, we don't let guilty pleas stop the inquiry. We don't let the fact of multiple false confessions in the same case stop the inquiry. We look for these sorts of compelling narratives of innocence, detailed explanations for why somebody confessed. And uh, we look for the, the documents, the opinions of earlier counsel. And sometimes you just got to take that leap of faith and take the case. So after the break, I think we'll tell you about um, what we do to investigate once we decide to take the case. <laughs>